creepy pickup artist. I've been reading all the amazing stories on this thread, and it made me think about my own unsettling experiences. Though my story is nowhere near as creepy as the other ones on here, I thought I'd share it just the same. A few years back, I was in my early 20s at the time. I spent New Year's Eve with an old friend I've known my whole life. We'd gone our separate ways after school as you do, and it was the first time we'd meet up in several years. Long story short, she ended up getting too drunk and things turned unpleasant. Since I was sleeping over at her house, which was a good 30 minute drive from my parents, and I was basically stranded in a distant town until I could reach my mom to pick me up, I waited until it was light out, left a note for my friend saying thanks for everything, and snuck out while she was asleep. It was a nice neighborhood, so I started walking since I knew I would have another couple of hours to kill before my mom could come and get me at the pre-appointed time. I eventually came upon a Sears. It was early on a Sunday morning and the massive parking lot was empty as the store had not yet been opened. I called my mom to let her know where I was, told her about the change of plans, and asked her to please come pick me up ASAP, figuring the store was as good a place as any to wait for her. Just as I hung up, a pickup truck pulled up to the entrance of the store where I was standing, and the driver rolled down the window and asked if I needed a ride. The guy looked and sounded normal enough, so I politely replied that my ride was on its way, and after asking again whether I was sure, he finally drove off. About half an hour later, the store had opened, and I decided to wander around inside while I was waiting for my mom to arrive. After a long browse around all the departments of the massive store, I headed back out to the parking lot to wait in the fresh air and sunshine. To my surprise, I observed the same pickup truck driving right towards me. The same guy leaned across the passenger seat and said, Listen, I can give you a ride to wherever you're going. Really, it's no problem. More peeved than startled at his reappearance, I again answered that my ride was on its way, turned, and walked back into the store to signal that the conversation was over. Inside, I called my mom, only to find that she was still at church and would not be coming to get me for another hour or so. Pertubed, I wandered around the large shop again, just waiting for the hour to finally be up. After about 50 minutes had passed, I walked back out the exit to the still empty parking lot to watch for my mom's car. The moment I walked out, the pickup quickly rolled up to where I stood at the entrance and the driver, all pretense of friendliness gone now, snapped, GET IN THE CAR! The hatred in his voice was so evident, I must have been shocked because to this day I still cannot recall what happened after he said that. I can only imagine what I would have done if he had, like so many people in that state, been carrying a gun. Thankfully he was not, and I must have noted it back to the safety of the store on autopilot and stayed in there until my mom finally came. It was only looking back on the situation afterwards that I fully realized how creepy and potentially dangerous it and the short temper pickup driver actually was. He must have been lurking and in or around that parking lot for a total of two hours at least. At the time, all I had felt was annoyance and anger towards the creepy short tempered stranger. In hindsight, I wish I had tried to remember his license plate number so I could have reported the incident since the casual ease with which he ordered me into his truck shows that picking up girls might possibly be something he makes a habit of. They wanted us to go with them. So after sharing experience on here, I thought of another story I could share. Again, for some insight, I'm a 25-year-old female. This particular incident I'm about to describe happened a couple years ago at a bar my friend and I frequented weekly. Looking back on it, I realize now how much danger we were in and how fortunate we were to come out unscathed. Also, I apologize in advance for how long this is. I tend to be very detailed in my storytelling. So, before I get ahead of myself, allow me to rewind to a couple of hours before this incident. It was a few hours before my friend had to go into work, and we had plans to grab a few drinks before she hit up her shift at a local bar. I had just arrived at her house, and we were on our regular walk to the bar. Note, not the same one she works at, which is not by any means a long distance, but does involve weaving through some shady areas and a dark trail that we sometimes take when it's still light outside and there's enough of us that we can handle ourselves. This night though, 
It was just me and my friend and it was very dark, so we took the longer way. I remember thinking how menacing the moon looked as it glowered an eerie orange in the night sky. A premonition, maybe? Uh, probably not. I'm just a very observant girl. We made it to the bar safe and sound, and were in the middle of ordering our drinks, when a group of nine men all decked out in business suits entered the room. Upon second glance, we noticed they had a woman with them. She was young, appearing to be in her early 20s, and unlike the men who were dressed like they were about to sit down for a business conference, she was dressed in casual jeans and a t-shirt. This was the first detail I noticed that seemed odd to me, but I shrugged it off. I didn't know them, and it wasn't my business, as far as I was concerned. They were just a group of businessmen who just come back from a long and probably very boring conference, and were now just unwinding for the rest of the night. The woman was probably a friend of theirs that met up with them along the way. No big deal at all. Still, they stood out like a sore thumb, and so every so often, we would look over at them to find that they were already staring in our direction. Okay. <laughs> fine. They probably just sense we've been paying closer attention to them than normal. We paid no more attention and chattered amongst ourselves about the things we usually do. Work, our social lives, our love lives. Nothing that anyone would find to be of great interest. I tuned out of our conversation, though, when I felt the man's eyes on us again. My ears perked at the mention of a few notable keywords. Two girls. Very pretty. Want the blonde. My stomach clenched. If they were talking about us, I was definitely the blonde girl. My friend hair is as dark as night, and me just the opposite. With the way they were looking over at our table, I knew they meant to us. Needless to say, I was instantly uneasy at the idea of nine random men talking amongst themselves in hushed voices about me and my friend. Then, to my dismay, the woman of the group came over to our table. This caught my friend's attention too, and her eyes scanned the woman with an expression that mirrored my own. The woman smiled brightly at us instantly, giving off a friendly vibe, too friendly. I hope this doesn't come off as creepy, but I just wanted to tell you that you girls are absolutely beautiful, she said. Uh, thanks, I said, instantly wary. My friend nodded a thanks too, barely looking at her, but she too looked uneasy. The woman seemed to take this to mean an invitation to sit with us, because that's exactly what she did. Before I realized what was happening, she had scooted into the booth to sit right next to me. See those guys over there? She said, pointing at the table of men from which she had come from. Yeah? Well, they've been wanting to talk to you girls from the moment they saw you both, but you know, they're really shy, so they asked me to come over here and talk to you for them. Uh, that's nice, I said, completely baffled by how weird all of this was. If they want to talk, though, they could have just come over here. I told you, they're shy, she said, and then giggled like a schoolgirl that made her seem way younger than she was. Yeah, I thought. All nine of these fully grown men are surely too shy to talk to a couple of 20-something-year-olds. See the cute, dark-haired one with a beard on the far left? She asked, pointing to one of the men at the table that fit that description. He's been dying to ask you out, she said to me, and then pointing to another guy. She proceeded to gush to my friend about how he was interested in her as well. When we didn't look as enthused as she expected, she prattled on about how she had known these men all of her life and how sweet and trustworthy they were, and that we just had to take her word for it because she's a girl too and she has our backs, something like that. Yes, how very convenient that the supposedly sweetest guys of the group had an eye on each of us respectively. I fought the urge to roll my eyes at how obvious of a setup this was. I waited impatiently for her to just cut to the chase and get to the proposition she had clearly come over for. I know how this must look to you girls, and you're probably used to this all the time. I totally get it. I would think the same thing, you know. Us girls, we have to look out for ourselves, right? Yes, she actually had the nerve to say this. You seem like smart girls. It's good to have a head on your shoulders, but you have nothing to worry about. I've known these guys since we were children, and they wouldn't harm a hair on anyone's head, much less two pretty young girls like yourselves. 
More flattery, more grooming, I had to hand it to her. This girl was a crafty manipulator. She was telling everything a girl in our position would want to hear, playing the female ally card to gain our trust. It was becoming blatantly obvious what role this woman played in this men's agenda. A female pursuer would seem much less threatening to two young females. I was disgusted. Anyways, the guys and I are about to leave for... And we love with you girls came along. You can come your own way and meet us there if you are more comfortable. They totally understand. They're total gentlemen. I bet. And don't worry, they'll pay for everything. Final red flag unleashed. This was far shadier than the motives of your average pickup artist. My friend and I shared a look of bewilderment from across the table, and then nodded in understanding that, as we came to an unspoken agreement on how to deal with the situation. Well, we appreciate it and tell them we are really flattered, my friend said politely with the fakest smile I've ever seen her muster plastered on her face, but we are leaving. The girl frowned, not even bothering to hide her disappointment. Why? Where are you girls off to? My friend shot her a look of annoyance clearly put off by this woman's nosiness, but she said, I have to work in 30 minutes. This actually wasn't entirely a lie. My friend was due to come into work, but not for a few hours. And this is when the girl's demeanor changed. Gone was the personable and sweet girl trying to be our friend to reveal a fucking snake. I'm not even exaggerating. In seconds, this woman transformed before our very eyes into a stone-cold predator. She was still speaking in the same friendly and polite tone, but her smile had twisted into a sneer, and her eyes had narrowed into beady slits as she glowered at my friend. How much? What? My friend asked, completely baffled. How much were you making tonight? She asked, although it sounded more like a demand than an inquiry. My friend divulged the amounts. The girl nodded and then walked off. We thought that was the end of it, and we breathed a sigh of relief. We could see she looked like she was conferring with her comrades about something, and then before we could move a muscle, she was walking back towards our table, looking more menacing than ever now. She took her seat next to me again. What if I told you? We would pay you twice the amount of money you'd be making tonight if you come party with us, she asked. I'd say that's cool, but like you guys would do that anyways. My friend said with a strained smile. The girl grinned, taking out her purse and pulling out the friggin' fattest wad of cash dumping it on the table in front of us. Our jaws dropped. This is thrice the amount you'd be paid tonight, she said. She even counted it for us. Now, we knew something was terribly, terribly wrong, and that her male friends weren't just pickup artists or even rapists. This was a business conference after all. Just a very different kind. Okay, my friend blurted out. I shot her a look that read something like, what the fuck are you doing? But she insisted that we go with them and that it would be fun. Here I was worried that I would have to do some serious damage control when she said, we'll go. I just have to go to the bathroom and freshen up. Oh. The woman seemed pleased with this and smiling, she put the money back into her purse and walked back to the table. One of the men looking over at us smiled and waved. We jumped up from our seats and practically raced out to the direction of the washrooms, which is in a hallway right around a corner that would conceal us from their praying eyes. As soon as we got the chance to talk, we shared the same thought that these people were running a sex trafficking ring and we needed to get out of there now. Our plan was to take that back exit, which was further down the hall from the bathrooms, but after some deliberation, we considered that the woman might be onto what we were really planning and would be waiting for us on the other side of the door. The back door also led into an alley, and we agreed that, and especially in a situation like this, it was far too risky. As luck would have it too, her phone was temporarily out of service and mine was dead. We decided that we would have to enlist a staff member's help. We walked back to the table and told them that we'd been going with them just as soon as we ordered our drinks. One of them offered to get it for us, but we were already power walking over to the bartender. We told them everything. They must have noticed that we were talking to him for longer than was necessary to order a few drinks and thank god they booked it out of there. All the same, the bartender told us not to go out there as they might be waiting for us outside and that he'd call a cab for us to make sure we got home safely. 
Thankfully, when our cab arrived and we stepped halfway outside, expecting them to jump out of the shadows and conk us over the head with bats, there... there was nobody in sight. We hurriedly climbed into the cab and took it back to her place. I am fully convinced that if we had agreed to go with them, we'd have been drugged and sold into sex trade. I'd probably be holed up in some prison somewhere across the world right now. The suits, the business-like nature of their meeting, the woman they sent over to try to gain our trust, a bribery. This was some seriously shady shit. The final nail in the coffin, though. A week later, a girl from the area was declared missing, and her body was found dumped in a creek outside of the city a month after this incident. Apparently, she last was spotted in that friggin' area of town. I don't know if there's any connection to these two events, but they very well could have been nothing to do with each other. Even though, I can't help thinking there was. Edit. In my recollection of this event, there was a specific detail I forgot to include in the story. In addition to the woman trying to lure us away with temptations and playing the female ally, one of her other games was pulling the lone female card by trying to guilt us into going with them on the pretense of her being the only girl in the group and how boring her night would be if we didn't go. It's a small detail, but it uncovers yet another layer of manipulation she had used to try to get us to come with her. Of course, that tactic did not work on us either, though I would include it for some completion purposes as I just now remember that specific part of it. Just the voice on the radio. In the summer of 2002, I had my very first paying job. I was only 20 years old and on summer break for college. For my freshman and sophomore year, I had worked at the campus radio station as part of my financial aids work study program. Somehow I landed a summer gig at a small station in my hometown. It's a smallish town. Home of the 2,000 happy people and a few soreheads, as the town's welcome sign reads. Nevertheless, it's a rather rural area, and this was the only station for 30 miles. The radio station may have been small, but it blanketed most of the county, with a population of over 20,000. I'm unsure of how many listeners the station actually had. I was young and naive and didn't get much attention to numbers. I do remember listening to the station when I was very young though, and that I had been through a couple of revamps in my lifetime, not just changing the studio's location from one side of Main Street to the other, further downtown, but also changing the call letters as well as the genre of music. When I was little, they played oldies, which I loved, and everyone could listen to, but the summer I worked, it was more of a classic rock station with a few modern alternative songs mixed in. To be honest, both genres were just my cup of tea and even at the age of 20, I held an impressive knowledge of interesting and relative trivia off the top of my head. I still do, but I was basically just a summer filler until, until school started up again. The job started off fairly nice actually. The studio's new location was in the same building as the county paper. My show started at 5 in the morning and ended at 9 a.m. followed by two hours of production, one hour for lunch, and then continuing to monitor the studio's live satellite feed until the next guy came in at around 2 p.m. He left the studio at around 11 p.m., meaning the building was vacant from his departure until my arrival in the morning. I had to be at the studio no later than 4.30 a.m. This meant that I was the only person in the parking lot or in the building until 8 a.m. When, when the administrative staff arrived. I had the key to the building, but it was only for the front door. There was a back door, but that required a different key. I wish I had that key. Every morning, I would unlock that front door, which faced Main Street, the busiest street in town, but obviously dead at 4.30 in the morning and I would lock the dead ball behind me as soon as I was inside. I didn't even turn on lights, I just went straight to my studio. I didn't have a password to the internet at the time, so I did most of my show prep at home, 
At the time, I had no reason to feel uncomfortable or scared. Yes, I was a 20-year-old woman alone in a building in the dark. But the building was right across the street from the police station, so I felt... So I felt very safe. Besides being a horror junkie, very little freaked me out anyways. Nevertheless, I never used my real name on the air, and nearly everyone in the office addressed me by my on-air name. The first couple of weeks on the job were awesome. Summer break for my college had let out before the local elementary and high schools had, so mornings were often spent with contests and chatting on air with kids about how excited they were for the upcoming break from school. Once school let out for the summer, listenership declined a bit, kids and their parents no longer listened to their radios while making the morning commute or riding the bus to school. That, that was okay. News and entertainment were what I was there for anyways. Even had a week-long spiel about my mom's ongoing battle with a possum who used the litter box on our back porch. The next week, listener called in with her own ridiculous and bizarre tales, a segment I simply called Story Time. Some of the stories were cute, some hilarious, some I didn't bother airing because they were incoherent, lame, or unintelligible. It was a Friday morning when he called. Warren. I remember his name clear as day. Warren McHale. It would be a name to haunt me for the rest of the summer. The call started as most did. Warren complimented my show and told me he listened every morning. I said thanks and gave my usual appreciation for having him as a listener. I can't even remember what his story was about, but I think it had something to do with one of his kids. It wasn't particularly entertaining, but I think I'd been a bit sparse on stories that morning, so I aired it anyways. Following that weekend, I came in on Monday and my show went on as usual. Tuesday, Warren called to say he'd missed hearing me on the air over the weekend, which I found a little bit odd, but whatever, I guess. He must have thought it sounded weird, so he requested a song as a cover. I obliged, of course. It was part of the job. Wednesday, he called again. This time, it was shortly after the start of my show, around 5.15 a.m. He requested another song. I thought it was bizarre that this guy would call me so early, especially since I'd only just started. But whatever. I didn't know anything about this guy, he could have been a farmer, and those could have been his normal hours, maybe hearing his request got him through the morning farm work or something. But then, not even 10 minutes after I played his song, he called me again, with another request. Now I was used to this sort of behavior, I mean, I was guilty of it as a child. When DJ played my song, I would get so excited to hear it on the air that I would immediately request another. However, it's somewhat of an unspoken rule amongst jockeys that you don't let the same person make more than one request a show, let alone within the same hour. So I gave him my canned, I'll see what I can do response. I actually did end up playing his requested song about two hours later, simply by coincidence, and I didn't realize I'd done it until he called about five minutes later to thank me and request yet another song. I didn't play it. Thursday morning, he called again at the start of my on-air shift, requesting the same song he'd last requested the day before. By this point, I was starting to get a little annoyed by him, so I made up some excuse about already having a request for a song by that same artist coming up that hour. I'm not sure why, but he didn't call back the rest of the morning after that. In order to avoid suspicion, I did play a song by that artist and made up the name of the person requesting it, just in case he was still listening. Warren didn't call at all during my show on Friday. I, I was relieved, actually, and had a great show. When it was over, I did my usual routine of listening to the weather radio to get the day's forecast for the midday news. At about 9.20 a.m., one of the girls in the newspaper office knocked on the studio door and told me I had a phone call. I thought that was odd. Someone would call the newspaper office looking for me. Family, friends, and my boss all had my cell phone number or knew to call the studio line until my shift ended at 2 p.m. I asked who was calling. She said, It was a man named Warren. Alarms went off in my head. Tell him I'm busy and he can call the studio line on Monday. The weekend was a blissful, Warren-free couple of days. Monday, no call from Warren. It was a good day. Tuesday, he was back. This time, he started asking me more personal questions, 
like about my own taste in music, if I was from the area, if I had a boyfriend, what I look like, etc. I told him I had a caller on the other line. He quickly requested a song and hung up. Wednesday was when things started to get weird. He called around 6.30 a.m., one of the, my busiest times of the morning, and asked me if it would be possible to bring his son in for a tour of the station, because he and his wife were going through a divorce, and he just wanted something to do with his son. I told him that it would be something he'd have to set up with my boss, but that my boss was unfortunately out on vacation that week and could not oblige him. Fair enough. He requested a song and hung up. When I got home, I sent my boss an email, pleading not to let this guy take a tour of the place until after I had left for the day, because he'd start to make me feel really uncomfortable. Thursday's show was great, no Warren. I thought maybe he wouldn't bother calling again until he could talk with my boss regarding a tour. However, when I left the studio and opened my car, I found a pale blue post-it note on my driver's seat not tucked under the windshield wiper, but actually lying in my seat. It was summer. I kept my windows cracked because of the heat, but I always, always locked my doors. So I figured someone must have just slipped a note through the crack, maybe a coworker, or maybe someone accidentally bumped my car or something, and it was a sorry note with some insurance information or something like that. It... It wasn't. The note was in messy handwriting. It said, I love your show. Call me sometime, Warren. And then his number. I felt so fucking sick at that moment. The parking lot had been filled with cars of employees and clients since 8 a.m. People usually started filtering in for the surrounding business about an hour before that. So how could he have known which one was mine unless he had physically been watching the building for me? Two possible scenarios popped into my head then. Either he had seen me leave and get into the car, which seemed unlikely, considering he didn't know what I looked like or when my shift ended, or he had watched the lot in the early hours of the morning. He knew my car was the only one in the lot when my show began at 5 a.m. I closed my car door, locked it, and walked quickly back into the building with the post-it in my hand. I found the office manager for the newspaper and told her everything. She informed the police across the street. They agreed to have an officer watch the building in the mornings when I arrived. We had his name and number, but I guess it wasn't enough to actually file charges. The next morning, my dad woke up at 4am just to drop me off to work. Dropped me off at the front door on Main Street. A cop sat in his car across the street. Both he and my dad waited until I was inside, locked the door, and gave them an all-clear wave before leaving. Warren didn't call that day, but he did send me an email. I have no idea how he got my personal email address, but he did. He said he was interested in pursuing a career in radio, and what he needed to do to break into the business, how we should meet outside of work to discuss it, asked me if some places I like to go, and if I'd like to see a movie, since his wife had the kids for the weekend. He even included a picture of himself. I... I did not respond. Immediately, I showed the email to my parents, and my mother printed it out. She worked as a nurse in the county ER for decades, and knew several officers. She told one of them what was going on and showed him the email. Monday, we followed the same routine as we had Friday morning. My boss's flight was delayed, so he would not be back until Tuesday. None of us seemed to mind. That is, until about 9.30 a.m., when Warren showed up at the office with his son. I never saw him. The studio didn't have any windows and the doors were solid wood. There was a knock at the door, followed by the voice of Patricia, one of the staff. It's Trish. Can I come in for a sec? Still in the process of writing midday news, I didn't think anything of it as I let her enter. I like Trish. I often spent my lunch break with her at her desk. So, out of all the rest of the employees, I'd have to say she was the one I was closest to other than my boss. I unlocked the door and she rushed in, closing the door behind her and leaning against it. She spoke in a hushed and hurried tone. That guy's here, she said. My eyes went wide and I felt sick. Warren? Yeah, he bought his kid. What? He said you told him he could have a tour of the place. No, I didn't. 
I said he'd have to call our boss to arrange it. I know, but he wants to talk to you. Oh my god, I want to vomit. So that's why I'm in here, to make it look like I'm asking you, but I'm going to go back out there and say you're busy and he must talk to the boss, okay? Thanks, Trish. This fucked up, she added, and started to leave. Lock the door behind me, she whispered and closed the door. She came back five minutes later to tell me he was gone, said she'd walk me to my dad's truck when my shift ended just in case. That day, dad took the scenic route home just in case we were followed. We weren't. Wednesday morning, Warren called. He let me know just how disappointed he had been and how disappointed his son was to have come all the way to not get a tour after all. Again, I told him to call my boss and set up a tour. Why can't you just give me one now? I couldn't breathe. It wasn't even 7 in the morning yet. Was he actually there right then, right outside? I didn't know what to do then. I couldn't think. I didn't say anything. I just hung up the phone. Immediately, I put on Queen's Greatest Hits CD to buy myself some time so my listeners wouldn't think anything was out of the ordinary. When I picked the phone back up to call the police, Warren must have called back at the exact same time because I didn't hear a dial tone. I freaked out, tears in my eyes. I thought he cut the phone lines. I... I was wrong. He called my name. I don't know if he said anything after that. I just dropped the phone back on the receiver and got out my cell phone, called the police station across the street. Barely even a minute later, I heard a banging from outside the studio. Someone was banging on the glass of the front door. I dared to unlock the studio and peek through the crack in the door to peer through the darkness to the front door, fully expecting to see large man with a gun waiting for me. Instead, I saw the reassuring silhouette of a police officer with his hands bridging his eyes against the glass so he could look in. I ran out of the studio and across the front room to unlock the door and throw my arms around this officer. Ask anyone who knows me, they'll tell me that I give out some of the best hugs because yes, I'm definitely a hugger, but I don't think I'd ever hugged anyone so tightly in all my life. I told him what happened. He told me to go into the studio and lock the door while he and his partner outside canvassed the building. I did, as he said, put in a couple of mixed billboard CDs to alternate between tracks with a couple of call letters peppered in and just sat there. Best I could, I gave the top of the hour weather report after about three minutes trying not to sound as shaken as I felt. I didn't answer the phone when it rang. David Bowie was playing when the officer returned to tell me that the building was clear and his partner didn't see anyone suspicious outside. Still, he offered to stay with me until the office staff arrived. Naturally, I took up on that offer, even made him and his partner coffee. I told Trish to let her know what was going on, since she was usually the first one in. She arrived a little early and brought sausage and egg biscuits for the cops as a thank you for staying with me. Warren wasn't charged or arrested. We couldn't prove he had physically been there and obtaining a phone record quickly just wasn't something a small town could do on a short notice. Warren didn't call for the rest of that week. In fact, to my knowledge, he never called again. There's a reason for that. The first week of August, I took some time off work to get my wisdom teeth removed. Due to being unable to speak clearly following their surgery, I couldn't be on the air and just stayed home. One afternoon, my mother came into my room and said she needed to speak to me. Mother said her officer friend had told her about something that had happened only a couple hours before. Warren had been involved in a standoff with the police. I'm fuzzy on the exact details. She said he had been in his pickup truck and pulled over on the side of a road. She said that Warren had called his wife, making the demands that she sleep with him or he would kill himself. Even though their divorce was not finalized, his wife already had a new boyfriend with the intent of moving in with him and marrying him. This must have broken Warren. He had parked on the side of the road, shotgun in the passenger seat. Police cars were on the other side of the road, attempting to talk him out, negotiate. They even called in his wife to talk with him, but of course, she refused to sleep with him. So, he put the gun in his mouth and pulled the trigger because it was such a public ordeal. The story was published in the paper the next day. I still start shaking. 
when I think about what could have happened if I'd actually ever agreed to meet him. Mr. Creepy Pants had a room for rent. A few years ago, my partner and I moved to the East Coast to the Pacific Northwest. We didn't know anyone in the city. We just saved up a decent chunk of money and hopped on a plane. It was exciting, and we certainly haven't regretted it. The plan was to stay at hostels and cheap hotels until we could find work and an apartment. Finding work was actually quite easy for us. We had new jobs within a week of getting off the plane. Finding somewhere to live, though, was a nightmare. Everywhere we looked had incredibly steep requirements for credit scores and minimum household income. We tried more legitimate sites at first, but after two months of hopping around to different hostels, motels, and Airbnb places, we became desperate, so we went to Craigslist. Many of the listings we tried gave us just as much trouble at first. So, one day, I'm desperately scurring Craigslist for rooms, and I come across one that seems a little weird. The poster said that he had a very large room in a nice neighborhood, and that he wanted to rent out a 500 square foot room for $600 per month, utilities included. In the city, that was suspiciously cheap. He also wrote it in a rambling sort of way. It was almost half ad for a room and half open letter to anyone that had recently accused him of being creepy. Now, obviously, if we weren't so desperate, we would not have even considered contacting this man, but we thought that we might have been at risk of running out of money before we could get in somewhere at this rate, so we gave him a call. On the phone, he sounded relatively normal. He actually suggested that we meet him in a public place, so to talk about the room first. We agreed to meet him at a restaurant near the hostel we were staying at, though we didn't tell him which one, of course. He showed up late and looked surprised to actually see us there. He sat down and talked for a long time. I said he talked rather than we talked because he rambled nonstop about himself and how he felt persecuted by everyone in the city. He claimed to be an artist and a collector. In between him repeating himself many times about how the locals just don't understand his passions, he also told us that the room he had advertised was currently filled with his collection. He never once said what he had collected, and that if things went well, he would have to hire people to move it into storage before we could move in. At one point, he stopped talking abruptly and ran to the restroom. We took this opportunity to discuss the situation. We knew at this point that he was probably a crazy person, but the threat of homelessness was looming, so we agreed that we should at least take a look at the place and decide based on that rather than his eccentricness. He came back to the table sweaty and flustered. Before we could say anything, he blurted out, I want to show you the apartment right now. We were surprised by this, but we had just discussed seeing it, so we agreed. I asked him to text me the address and that we would take public transportation to meet him there. He insisted that he drive us there since we did not have a car. Now, we were obviously hesitant to get in his truck, but the previously mentioned desperation was still a thing and we were pretty sure he wasn't going to try to hurt us. So we crammed into the front seat of his tiny, rusty, ancient-looking pickup truck. My partner was pressed up against the door, and I was uncomfortably close to the driver as he continued his babble about how the city had gone downhill and how everyone he used to hang out with shuns him these days. At one point, I whispered to my partner to get ready for a possible tuck-and-roll situation. He saw me whispering, but couldn't hear me over the wind roaring through the cab of the truck. One of the windows was broken out, really added to the vehicle's charm, and he said something about we were romantic together and that he envied our youth. We arrived at his house minutes after that. He had been technically honest up to this point. His neighborhood was decent looking, and his home was a pretty large one-story ranch house. I noted out loud that he had bars on all of his windows and several locks on his front door. He said that his collection was very valuable to him, and he was just protecting it from thieves. Once he let us in, I made a point of urging him ahead so that he couldn't get a chance to lock the door behind us. We very quickly noticed three things, his art, his collection, and the smell. The man's method of art of which he was very proud, 
was apparently to take lots of innocent childlike things, baby dolls, stuffed animals, ceramic figurines, children's toys, etc., and attach dildos to them. One of the most notable pieces being the one he referred to as his unicorn. It was a ceramic horse figurine that he sloppily sawed the head off of and replaced with a baby doll's head and added a hand-sculpted clay penis as the horn. His collection consisted mainly of rubber, plastic, and latex clothing and gas masks. Both his collection and his art was everywhere. The place was so jam-packed with junk that every room had only a single file path going through it that you could walk without bumping into art or stepping on piles of fetish wear. This fellow was definitely not concerned about cleanliness. The place reeked of mildew and moldy rubber. The carpet looked as if it hadn't seen a vacuum since the 70s. As we passed through the kitchen, he declared that he loves cast iron pans because you don't have to wash them. Just as we noticed that every countertop was cluttered with rusted pans that all looked to have decades worth of scorched food caked on. We stayed behind him, mostly silent, as he stopped every now and then to point out his favorite art pieces and to repeatedly tell us he was leading us to the room and that it was full of his favorite stuff right now, but that he'd get people to move it out for us. He said that like us moving in was a sure thing. He opened the door to the room and actually said, voila. I don't doubt that the room was around 500 square feet, but every inch of it was stuffed with clothing racks. The clothing racks were all packed with the same thing, shiny rubber latex and plastic pairs of pants with dildos sewn to the front of them. Up to this point, we were doing our best to avoid reacting to all of this freaky stuff in this guy's home because we were afraid he would snap on us if we did. But I started to notice after a while though that he was getting disappointed that we weren't reacting to anything. My guess is that he gets off on shocking people with his creepy pants and that this wasn't going as well as he has hoped. We told him that the room looked big enough and that we liked to go back to our hotel and think it over. He didn't have much of a reaction to that, but he agreed to drive us home now. When he thought that I wasn't looking, he took something out of his pocket and tossed it through the open doorway of a dark room on his way past out. I was afraid that it might have been his car keys, so I used the light on my phone to peek in as we passed that room. The whole room was a pile of tied off used condoms, or sperm balloons as my partner called them later. We later speculated that he was masturbating at the restaurant and added a balloon to the pile before taking us back. So we piled back into his truck and had a long awkward drive back to the place we had met. His rambling was much more frustrated this time around and he passed where we wanted to get off three times before we just jumped out at a red light frantically shouting, this is good here, uh, well, thanks for meeting you, B bye. I added his number to my contacts as Mr. Creepy Pants. Over the next several days, he sent a few text messages asking if we talked it over yet. I wanted to be polite, so I just said, we decided against it, but thank you for the very nice offer. He responded with the phrase, are you creeped yet? copied and pasted over and over about 30 times. I'm not sure why I was still trying to be polite, but when he stopped spamming me, I responded, No, we thought that your collection was lovely, but it's just so large that we can't bring ourselves to ask you to move it. It took him a few more days to respond, but he did, and he took it better than I expected. Yeah, I really didn't want to move it, thanks for understanding. He then made a recommendation for a local burger place for some reason. I blocked his number shortly after that, just, just to be safe. For the record, we didn't care that he was a fetishist of some sort, we cared that he was really friggin' gross. So, Mr. Creepypants, let's not meet again.